Uh, so, good morning, everybody. My name is Julian. I'm a tech evangelist with AWS, and uh, I focus on AI and machine learning. Uh, this session will focus on uh, um, our, uh, well, my preferred service, I should say, for <laughs> machine learning called Amazon SageMaker. And uh, I'll start with a quick recap, a very quick recap on what SageMaker does. And then uh, we'll dive into the more advanced uh, features and the latest features that have come, um, uh, that have come up uh, recently. And we'll cover uh, cool things like uh, hyperparameter optimization uh, and so on. So um, lots of demos, notebooks. And uh, if you have questions, uh, I guess we have time for questions during the session, right? It's gonna, I want this to be interactive. So anything you don't understand, please raise your hand, right? So really quickly, uh, SageMaker got released uh, at reInvent last year, so just under a year old now. And it's a managed service for machine learning and deep learning, okay? And we build this for one main reason. <laughs> uh, it is to make machine learning accessible to all developers, no matter what their uh, skill level is, and, uh, and without ever managing a single server. As you probably know, if you do machine learning today, and you're in the room, so I'm guessing you are, um, there is a, a, an awful lot of infrastructure and plumbing required when you do machine learning, right? Dev environments, training clusters, prediction clusters, uh, and if you work within a large team, it just gets worse and it stands in the way. So just like uh, we've done for, I would say, normal infrastructure, uh, we, we would also like to make machine learning infrastructure transparent. So uh, we have a number of modules, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details right now. You will see in the notebooks how this really works. But in a nutshell, we have three big blocks. One that lets you build quicker. Uh, we provide what we call notebook instances, so managed EC2 instances with uh, Jupyter and all the libraries uh, for machine learning and, uh, and deep learning that are pre-installed. So just fire up an instance, open a notebook in minutes. Uh, we have a collection of built-in algos. I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about these because they are, I believe, truly innovative and a huge time saver. The second big module is the training module, okay? Training uh, with your data set without touching a single server. So it is literally a one click or, as I much prefer, a one API call thing. Uh, just uh, ask SageMaker to fire up um, X instances of type Y and off it goes, and that's all you need to do, right? Fully managed. Uh, we'll talk about HPO, which is crucial to get optimal performance. And when it comes to deploying, uh, you, can do, um, you can deploy what we call an endpoint. Again, an HTTPS endpoint backed by one or many different web servers. Again, fully managed. Um, that will auto-scale, just like uh, for EC2. Or you could do batch prediction, and we'll look at that as well, OK? Um, it's important to uh, underline the fact that you can try this service for free if you've never tried SageMaker before. It's part of the free tier, so just go to aws.amazon.com slash free, and you'll see uh, uh, the terms uh, and conditions for, uh, for the free tier. And uh, you can basically use that service for free for the first 12 months following the creation of your account up to a certain level of usage, right? But more than enough to, to, uh, to uh, learn about the service. So under the hood, because it is an advanced session, so let's open the hood right away. All the, tra all the training and prediction activity uh, is based on Docker containers, okay? So um, you need to host your containers in a service called Amazon ECR, which is our uh, Docker repository. And, and you can select the training container corresponding to the algo that you'd like to train with. So it could be one of the built-in algos, it could be something else, as we will see in a minute. And then you write what, what I call helper code, so just a few lines of, of Python code using the SageMaker SDK to get everything going. So basically saying, take this algo, um, uh, my data is in this bucket in S3, here are my parameters, train, okay? And SageMaker will pull that container on, on the um, EC2 instances that it has created for you, run the training job, once it completes, those instances shut down automatically, so you stop paying. You will never overpay for training. The model gets saved in S3, and you could stop there, okay? You could grab that model that 
uh, a built-in model uh, which is based on uh, MXNet, or, or it could be your TensorFlow code, or it could be anything, really. So just grab the model in S3 and maybe run it on your laptop or, or run it on your own machine. Okay? If, you're, if you want to deploy further, then, okay, same story. Write some helper code to say, please deploy on uh, four uh, M4 Excel instances, let's say. Uh, SageMaker will create EC2 instances according to that, will pull the, the prediction container corresponding to that algo, will load the models from S3, create the uh, HTTPS endpoint, and you can start serving uh, predictions with that. Okay? Or you could do batch transform, as we will see. Okay, so bottom line, everything runs on Docker. Um, but for the most part, you don't need to know the first thing about Docker to do this, okay? <laughs> Usually people say, oh, oh my god, I thought I was doing machine learning, now I'm doing DevOps. Um, you could do both, by the way. It's actually fun. Uh, but I would say 95% of the time, you really don't need to know the first thing about Docker, okay? You only need to get into that Docker thing if you want to build your own container, okay? So, what are your training options when it comes to uh, um, algos? So we have a collection of built-in algos. I'll talk about those in detail in a minute. Uh, typical machine learning and deep learning algos implemented by Amazon. Okay, we'll look at the list. And we'll focus quite a bit on that today. Uh, you could also bring your own script. So uh, bring your own code into one of the four built-in environments for deep learning libraries. Okay, so MXNet, Chainer, TensorFlow, PyTorch, just use that uh, TensorFlow object or that PyTorch object in the SageMaker SDK, pass your script literally as a parameter, and off you go. Okay, so no need to install TensorFlow ever again. Or, uh, last option, you could really bring your own container. So, let's say you want to use maybe Cafe or you want to use another deep learning library, or maybe you have your custom code for training and prediction. Um, your super optimized C++ code that the company wrote uh, and you want to run that, no problem. Uh, this is when you need to know a little bit about the Docker thing. So create a container following a few guidelines, um, allowing SageMaker to invoke the right script into the container and really a few basic things like this, really about the interface uh, between SageMaker and your code. And, and you can just build a container, push it to ECR and use it just like anything else. Okay, so the bottom line is you can really run any kind of machine learning workload on SageMaker. But let's talk about the, one of my favorite parts in that service, the built-in algos. So, <clears throat> oh wow, that's a flashy slide. Uh, looked flashy on my screen, it's even worse now. But, uh, so yes, there's a color code, so let's get that out of the way. So, uh, the orangey thing is supervised. Algo supervised training, the yellow things are unsupervised. Okay, so today we have a, a, a total of 14 algos, 14 built-in algos that you can literally take and run immediately. Okay, so we have the usual things. Uh, so a linear learner for a regression and classification, binary and multi-class. Factorization machines, which is, which is kind of a generalization of uh, the, the, the one above. KNN, XJBoost, okay, and this one is a little bit different. It's the only one that hasn't been implemented by Amazon, okay? All the other ones are really Amazon implementations. This one is the open source implementation you could find on GitHub, okay? So if you're, the good news is if you're familiar with XJBoost in general, it's gonna be the same on SageMaker. And then, you know, K-means, unsupervised stuff, K-means, PCA, uh, random forest for um, uh, anomaly detection, okay? And then we have two algos um, uh, for deep learning tasks, so image classification and object detection, um, SSD, right? Uh, then we have a bunch of algos for uh, natural language processing in general, so uh, NTM for topic modeling, uh, LDA for mostly for topic modeling, and uh, as a matter of fact, this one is used by one of our high-level services called Amazon Comprehend for uh, topic modeling. So we, use, uh, we eat our own dog food or machine learning food. Uh, blazing text, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So blazing text is um, basically 
the next step beyond uh, fast text, which you probably know to compute word embeddings and so on. Uh, fast text is, is great, but it only runs on CPU. It's a, it's a Facebook algo, Facebook implementation. So blazing, blazing text now support GPU. So it can really compute uh, word to vec and a few other things um, at massive speed, okay? Uh, sequence to sequence, another uh, uh, well-known algo. It, it can be used for machine translation and other things, and this is actually used by Amazon Translate, another one of our high-level services. And last but not least, uh, the, the crazy one, uh, Deep AR, uh, which is a, it's a time series forecasting <coughs> algo. It's quite complicated, but uh, pretty, pretty powerful. Okay, so that's the current list. It might very well change tomorrow because we keep adding uh, uh, to that list. When we launched, I think we had only 10, and since launch we added, I believe, KNN, uh, Blazing Text, DPR, and yeah, object detection. Okay, so we keep adding more algos to the list according to customer feedback and, uh, and I guess the most uh, requested machine learning workloads out there. So um, DPR uh, has, been, has been published, so um, um, it's, been, it's been designed by uh, our uh, machine learning uh, uh, development center in Germany, so you can go and grab that research paper. I have to warn you, it is very, very dense, um, but it is a fascinating algo, and it's a short session today, so I don't have a lot of time to go into why deep AR is really better than the typical uh, RNN stuff for time series, but Okay, read that and then uh, you'll get the good stuff, okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just a lame excuse to, to justify that. I, I really didn't understand it until the end, but okay. It is a very dense paper. Uh, Blazing Text has also been published, uh, and uh, there, there was a very extensive blog post on our machine learning blog, I'll share the URL later, comparing the, the performance of Blazing Text um, with the fast text and other implementations. So again, if you enjoy reading research papers and getting uh, plenty of algo details that will make your head spin, I'm sure, uh, you can go and grab those, okay? And uh, just before I go into, uh, into my first demo, um, I, I just wanna show you that we keep adding stuff to this service, okay? So if you looked at SageMaker when it first came out about a year ago, um, you definitely need to look again more algos and, and generally more features. So HPO was in preview. Uh, it's, now, uh, it's now been generally available. I will show it to you in a few minutes. As I've said, some new algos and, and improvements to existing algos, okay? New, uh, new modes and, uh, and new tiny features, new uh, uh, cost functions for a linear learner as well. I mean, it keeps moving, right? And yeah, image classification literally days ago. Uh, now supports uh, multi-label classification, which is very good for uh, complex uh, tasks, and mixed mode training where you can train. Um, uh, you can train on, uh, y you can use 32-bit uh, uh, arithmetic during training and, and, and then shrink to 16-bit training. Uh, and that gives you a smaller model and a faster model, which is especially important if you deploy those models at the edge. Right, and you, you want to save memory during inference on smaller devices. Okay, so plenty of new things. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at one of those examples, okay? Here it is. Okay, so I have to show you the SageMaker console, okay? All right, that's the SageMaker console. Quite nice, right? Okay, create a notebook instance, click on open, and then you jump into a Jupyter notebook, as, like I said, okay? And we have a pretty cool collection of, uh, of uh, examples. Um, they are available on GitHub as well. Uh, you'll get the URL. And these show you uh, the all, pretty much all the different ways you can use uh, SageMaker with the different libraries and the different built-ins, et cetera. So um, the ones I'm, I'm using today come from that. Okay. All right. So as you will see, the workflow for uh, for a SageMaker um, job is always the same. Okay. You need to import the SageMaker SDK first. It's a Python SDK. Uh, we also have a Spark uh, SDK for uh, Python and Scala. So you can you could from your uh, Spark job fire up 
um, uh, training and prediction activities in SageMaker. Okay, but I'm, I'm not going to cover this today. If anybody uses Spark and wants to know more, uh, come and talk to me afterwards. Right? I can convince you it's actually a good idea. Um, okay, so create an S3 bucket because as you can guess, all the data that we train on needs to be uh, stored in S3. Okay, then I'm going to download the data set, download it to um, the notebook instance first. Okay, uh, we're going to look at it and then uh, we'll upload it to S3. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a data set called DBpedia. And we're doing text classification here. So the data set is uh, a, a, um, a set of sentences uh, with a label. And we have, I, I believe, uh, 14 or 15 categories in there. Okay, so trying to classify sentences into 15 categories, describing the, I would say, maybe the main topic of the, of the sentence. Okay, so that's what we're working on here. And here are the, the, the categories. Okay, and yes, 14 categories. Okay, company, artist, athlete, plant, etc., etc. Okay? All right, so as usual, when we work with uh, uh, text, uh, we have to tokenize it. So we have to split those sentences into, into words, into space separated words. Uh, we need to insert spaces before uh, the, the uh, punctuation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so I, I won't go into that thing in detail. We are using uh, uh, NLTK to do this. All right. So basically, just tokenizing the data set. Okay, and that takes uh, a few, maybe a minute or so. And then I'm going to upload the tokenized data set into S3. Okay, because once again. This is where SageMaker needs to pick it up. So here it, we're doing the whole thing, right, from A to Z. But um, if you're working with production data, it's quite likely you would have that data in S3 already, or it would be, uh, especially if it's text, or, or it would be in uh, maybe in a database, who knows. So uh, you could have another workflow to extract that data from where it is and put it in your S3 bucket, right? Of course, you don't have to do this in the notebook, it's just for demo purposes here. Okay, so we upload the data again to S3, and then we can get to work. So as I've said, everything is based on containers. So I need to grab uh, the name of the container for uh, blazing text in the region where I'm running. Okay, so I, I've got this helper function here. And as you can see, this is the, the fancy name for that container blah, 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 EU West 1, because this is running in the uh, Dublin region, okay? And again, if you're working with built-in with built algos, this is as much Docker as you need to know, so <laughs> not so much, right? Okay, and now we can train. So there are different modes for blazing text. Here I want to use uh, classification, and this is an important object to understand. This is the object that lets you configure a training job. It's called the estimator. And you pass the, the name of the container, so basically the algo you want to train on. Uh, and important things here, how many instances you want to train on. So we'll simply train on one C4 4XL instance, okay? which is one of the compute-oriented uh, instance types in AWS. Okay? And uh, how many rounds do I want to train on, et cetera, et cetera, and where to store the model, and that's pretty much it, right? So as you can see, this is as much infrastructure as you will uh, deal with, really. Okay, SageMaker takes care of everything. Okay, so no, no uh, server installation, no SSH keys, no, no nothing. Just go and train. Okay. All right, then. Here comes the machine learning part, right? Of course, you need to set hyperparameters. So you'll find all of those in the, in the online documentation. And this is where reading the, that uh, complex paper helps. <laughs> uh, I have to say documentation is, is a little bit you know, uh, short for those, uh, uh, for those uh, hyperparameters. Some of them make sense. Some of them are, are more advanced. And I would recommend reading the paper to understand uh, what what the impact is for those, okay? But anyway, 
Let's pretend we read everything. Uh, we're going to train for 10 epochs. Uh, we'll use a learning rate of 0.05. Uh, we use uh, uh, 10 word uh, vectors. Uh, we can use early stopping uh, with a patience of four, which means if, if accuracy stops improving after four epochs, we stop training. Okay, it's always difficult to know how long you should train. So that's, that's an easy way not to train for too long, right? And, uh, and again, sa you can save money with that. Uh, and off we go, right? Okay, we define where the training data, validation data is, and then we train calling fit, okay? And so this creates that instance that we ask for, pulls the blazing text container to it, injects the hyperparameters, points everything at your data in S3, and, and you can see the log, okay? So you can see that log here. You can also get the log in CloudWatch Logs, uh, which is the, um, the preferred way, place where we put all the logs in the AWS. Okay, so again, if you're not running in a notebook, if you're running this thing automatically, programmatically, you will get your log in CloudWatch Logs. Okay, so it runs for a bit. It is actually very fast, right? We get 23 million words per second. Uh, we could do much, much better, but it's only a C4 instance. But this shows you, this literally trained for 47 seconds. Okay, so it is a very fast algo, even on CPU. And, and for a GPU, you can get to insane speed. So if you have huge, huge, huge data sets, um, you know, blazing text is the, is the one to use. Okay, so at this point, that training instance shuts down. We stop paying for that. And we have a model in S3. Okay, and like I said, we could go and grab the model and deploy it on our own machine if we wanted to. Okay, it is in all the built-ins except XJBoost are based on uh, MXNet, okay? But here we want to deploy, so one line of code to deploy this on, uh, on, on a web server, M4XL in this case. So we wait for a few minutes for the instance to be created, the web server to be deployed, et cetera, et cetera, and then we can serve some predictions, okay? So let's take a couple of sentences here. Uh, we have to tokenize them, okay, again, so split them uh, split them uh, into uh, words, uh, space-separated words, uh, make sure we have space before punctuation, etc. And then we can invoke the endpoint, right, that we created. And uh, we can do this with the predict API in the SageMaker SDK. If you didn't want to do it like that, you could HTTP post to the endpoint, right? It is an HTTPS endpoint. So you have a URL, you can post your stuff to that and get results, okay? Again, in the notebook, it's simple and simpler to do it like that. Okay, and then print some results, all right? So uh, these are the, see, the tokenized uh, sentences. And so the first one with very high probability is about a company. So it's a bit of a lame example, I have to say. I should fix it because it, it actually has the word company in there. So it's a bit of a giveaway, but okay, right? I think uh, whoever wrote this great notebook wanted to, be, to have a very, very high score. <laughs> and the other one says, uh, yeah, again, 99.5% educational institution, but this one says college, so come on. Okay, so all right. If you give it simple examples, it, it does really well, but you get the point, right? Uh, you pass your sentences and you get your classes. Here we just return the top one. Uh, we could return, um, we could ask for the, you know, uh, the top two or top K classes. And okay, of course, here there's really no doubt it is about a company, it is about an institution. Okay? And once we're done, we could delete the endpoint. Okay? That we created and stop paying for that. Okay, so that's the SageMaker workflow. Okay? Put your data in S3, wherever it came from initially. Uh, use the estimator object to set up the training job. Define hyperparameters. Um, train. And then if you want to deploy on SageMaker, deploy and, and then get predictions. It's always the same. You will see all those notebooks look, look the same, right? OK. So all those 14 algos pretty much work like that. But there's one uh, thing we didn't really cover, right? 
which is hyperparameter optimization. So if you're not familiar with the problem, uh, just think about the example we looked at. We had maybe six or seven parameters there. And how did we know those were the optimal values, right? How did we know we would get the best accuracy with those? So literally what we're trying to, to see here is if we have, let's say, 10 hyperparameters, we have this 10 dimension space. And we're trying to find the, the, the spot in that 10 dimension space that gives us the optimal accuracy, right? So in a sense, if you've seen uh, that great movie, yeah? It's exactly like that. You're navigating that high dimension space, not being, not being quite sure where you landed, right? Not being quite sure you're at the right point in time, specifically. OK. So that's the problem we're facing. And it is a difficult problem. So over time, people started with manual search, OK? AKA, I know what I'm doing, right? I know what the values are, OK? Maybe, but the problem with this is usually um, you start, you, you get to a model that is kind of OK, and you tweak a little bit around uh, the, the values that you have, but you're very, very, very reluctant to try another algo or a variation of your algo because it's probably going to break all those handcrafted hyperparameters that you found. So I don't recommend it. Okay, for, for toy problems, it's fine. For real life problems, it's not fine. So the second option is random search. Okay, so in that 10 dimension space, um, take uh, uh, maybe 100 or 200 um, combinations Right, so literally spray and pray, and hoping that okay, one of them will give you uh, good accuracy. Surprisingly, it it works it works pretty well, right? Um, at the expense of training a lot and never being quite sure if you've been lucky, clever, or if you, you know, if you can reproduce it. Uh, a more organized method is grid search. So grid search will start with random uh, points. Uh, look at accuracies and then zoom in. Uh, the, th the assumption here, there will, is there, there will be a cluster of trainings that are significantly better than anything else. So it's like, oh, this area looks fine, right? This part of the tesseract is interesting. So let's try and zoom in on that again. Maybe train another 100 times within that small space and gradually zooming in on the optimal model. So. It hasn't, been, it hasn't been proven more effective than a random search, which is really depressing. Um, and it will, uh, it will lead to literally hundreds and hundreds of training. So some libraries have, have actually this built in. They let you do grid search uh, automatically. But OK, you know, be ready for lots of coffee breaks. And, uh, and potentially, uh, yeah, an expensive AWS bill if you, if you go too crazy on this. So the clever way is HPO. Use machine learning, right? After all, that's what we do. We use machine learning to solve machine learning. That's pretty nice. So um, this has been proven to uh, require fewer trainings, OK? Uh, so uh, because every time we train, we get a new data point. For this combination of parameters, this is the accuracy we get. And by, by stacking those results and applying optimization, um, we can actually uh, get quicker to maybe not the optimal set of parameters, but at least a really, really good one. Okay? If you want to know how this works, um, this uses two techniques called uh, Gaussian process regression and Bayesian optimization. Um, if you can't sleep tonight, this is the thing, right? I can promise in two minutes you'll sleep like a baby, right? <laughs> Uh, and if you want to know more, um, we have uh, pointers to research articles here. Okay, so it, the intuition is not complicated; the math is crazy complicated, as as usual. So let's take a look. So actually, in this notebook, we start. Um, not sure what this window is. So here I'm using Gluon, which is part of the uh, MXNet library, to learn uh, the Cypher 10 data set um, with, a, with a CNN. Okay? So everybody knows Cypher 10, I suppose. Image, well-known image data set, uh, 10 classes, hence the name. 
very tiny images, 32 by 32 pixels. Very, very hard to train because 32 by 32 pixels. Okay. So it's a good one if you want to push uh, your algo to the limits. So it starts the same, really. So uh, import SageMaker, um, download Cypher 10. So the data set is ready here. No cleaning to do, no nothing. So just upload it to S3. Uh, we have uh, an MXNet uh, script here. Uh, and uh, we're going to pull uh, a ResNet uh, a blank ResNet model from the, the Gluon model zoo. Okay? Uh, if, you're, if you've never looked at Gluon, I, I, I recommend you take a look. It's a, it's a high level API similar to PyTorch, let's say, on top of MXNet. And it has a pretty extensive model zoo. Okay? So if you've never looked at it, you can take a few hours and, and learn about it. Okay, so here I'm using the uh, MXNet container, and I'm just literally taking that script and injecting it into my uh, pre-built container. So I'm going to train once, okay? And as you can see, I use the MXNet object from the SDK, passing the script, asking for one P38XL instance, which is a big one, uh, and with a few <laughs> hyperparameters, because I know what I'm doing, right? OK, and then it trains. And it trains pretty fast, because it is a very fast instance. Now, this one has, uh, um, this one has four, yes, four NVIDIA V100s in it, so pretty fast. OK, and then we train for 50 epochs. And we get to a very disappointing accuracy of 53%. Right, which is terrible. You would never deploy that. <laughs> it's literally wrong half the time, okay? trying to classify those 10 image classes. Okay? But anyway, we trained once. It took seven and something minutes, right? seven minutes and a half. Okay? And we have a model. So we can't be satisfied with this. So we're going to use the random technique because we know it works. So um, we have some extra code in this notebook to generate random values for the hyperparameters. You can, you can look it up. It's, it's really, really simple. And so here, I'm going to try that again. Okay, um, So create a, a small function that will run MXNet jobs with different values for the hyperparameters. So I'll stick to the batch size, but I will take random values for the learning rate, the momentum, and the weight decay Okay, using those ranges. And again, this code is a bespoke code in the notebook, okay, to generate random values. Okay, and then I'm doing this 120 times, so training 120 times, picking random values for those three hyperparameters. And to speed things up, I'm training eight jobs in parallel, okay? So it's gonna, li it's gonna literally require eight P3, eight Excel instances. Um, this notebook is known as the $400 notebook, okay? <laughs> it says at the top. So <laughs> So I'm not paying my bills, but you are, and uh, so just be careful. But um, actually, those cells are have not been uh, reset in the notebook, so you can look at the results without spending your $400. Okay. So after a bit, uh, we can look at all the accuracies and, and sort them. Okay, and we see that the top accuracy that we got was 73.6 or 7 percent. OK, and we, we can see our hyperparameter values. So this is much better, right? We trained 120 times, and we increased accuracy by 20% compared to that single training, which, which goes to show that I really don't know what I'm doing when I'm picking hyperparameter values. OK, so now this took a while. This costs money, and it's random. So how do we know we couldn't, maybe we could go a little higher than this, right, 73.6. So yeah, we could plot everything and, and yeah, be satisfied with it or not. OK, so here we're not satisfied. And we're going to use the HPO feature in, um, in SageMaker. So again, training, OK, no change to the code, defining hyperparameter ranges. Defining the metric that I want to optimize on. So here I want to optimize on validation accuracy. So I, I, I should give a small, a simple regex 
to a sage maker saying, this is what you should be looking for in the training log, right? This is that field here, right? If you see validation, accuracy equal, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's the metric, okay? You, you literally teach SageMaker to read the log here. And then you create a hyperparameter tuner object, okay, saying, okay, this is the job I want to train on, this is the metric I want to optimize on, these are the ranges you should explore, uh, and you can train 30 jobs and two at a time, okay? Ideally, you would train one at a time, because like, as I've said, it, that Bayesian optimization thing is iterative. So every time you get a new data point, you can learn. To speed things up, you could say train twice, train two jobs at a time, and so you'll get uh, 15 iterations instead of 30, but that should be enough to increase, okay? So it's a trade-off between speed and, uh, and accuracy. The cost will be identical, okay? So we train, we wait for a bit, but a shorter bit because we only train 30 times, not 1 and 20, okay? And... So we see all the statuses here, and we see that the top value is now, for accuracy, is now 73 point, well, it's almost 74. All right, give me 74 on that one. So what this shows is we train 30 times instead of 120 times, so four times faster, four times cheaper, and we get higher accuracy, okay? And 0.3, 0.4% is not, is not something to to discard, right? For image classification, it, it, it has actually large consequence on big data sets. Okay, so there you go. Okay, no change to the code. Um, just use that hyperparameter tuner object and off you go, right? HPO in action. I like it. All right, I got a few more things um, I want to show you really quick. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time talking about algos because it's really the the core thing in SageMaker, but there are some, I would say, infrastructure features that, uh, that deserve to be mentioned. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk briefly about a few things. Uh, pipe mode, which is a way to stream data to instances, and that lets you uh, work with infinitely large data sets. Uh, batch transform, so how do you actually run prediction without deploying an endpoint, and then private link, um, because every AWS talk needs to have something about VPCs, right? So batch transform is exactly what you would think. It's uh, running batch predictions, okay? So if you have, imagine you need to predict a full data set, you know, 100 terabytes, of course you're not gonna HTTP post 100 terabytes, okay? So if you need to predict a lot of data, uh, if you don't need uh, real-time prediction, if you don't need low latency, or if you need to run a ton of pre-processing on the data before actually running prediction, it's a good solution, okay? Um, you can even, if you have a data stream or if you have a really, really, really large data set, you can create something a little weird which is called an infinite stream. So it's a batch prediction that never ends, <laughs> right? bit of a weird concept, but yeah, that's how we solve it, okay? So it is very easy to use. You train as usual, just as we saw. Uh, you create a transformer object, which is another object in the SageMaker SDK, and you use it, okay? And then you get your results uh, in JSON format in Amazon S3, okay? So just to illustrate, I want to show you how that looks. All right, so this is TensorFlow, right? Learning MNIST for the millionth time, injecting a TensorFlow script, very similar to the previous example, training with the TensorFlow object here, very similar to what we've seen. And then instead of deploying to an endpoint, it's a one line, uh, it's, it's a one line of code to create that transformer object, right? And it's one line of code to actually run the batch predictions. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the size of the data set is. Two lines of code, you can batch predict everything and you will get your results in S3. Okay, so cool feature. And the last one I wanna talk about, oh, the, almost the last one, is pipe mode. 
So imagine you need to predict a petabyte, uh, you need to train on a petabyte of data, right? Obviously, this doesn't fit in memory, right? We, we, we don't have petabyte uh, sized instances yet. Okay. So what pipe mode does is it's going to stream, it, it's not going to copy the data to the training instances because it won't, it, it won't even fit maybe on the storage, right? So it's going to stream it, okay, so, and train in streaming mode. And so now the memory consumption on your training instances is completely flat, okay? If you can maximize the amount of memory that is used, but if you have one petabytes, two petabytes, it doesn't matter because the, the pipe mode will just give you chunks to train on, okay? So you can train on anything, okay? And we call this yeah, infinitely scalable algorithms. And of course, uh, time and cost should be linear um, versus, uh, with respect to data size. Uh, just add more instances if you want to speed up. And as an example, this is a benchmark of uh, the factorization machines built in Algo. And uh, we're training it uh, on a click, prediction, a click prediction data set, pretty large data set, one terabyte. And we're using this uh, M4 for Excel. And these have only 64 gigabytes, okay? So that doesn't fit. So we're using pipe mode to stream. And not only do we get uh, best of breed scores, okay? Um, so this is uh, other implementations that I, I can't name, <laughs> unfortunately. But we get, uh, we get a really good, uh, uh, really low loss. We get a good F1 score for the, for the classifier. And we see that we have perfect scaling, right? And does this ever happen in, in real life? If you have 10 machines, it takes about 7.5 hours. If you add, if you double the number of machines, you literally divide this by two, right? If you, divide, if you add twice the machines, right, you pretty much divide it by two again. So the cost is constant. It's, you just decide how fast you want your results. Okay, and this is the result of pipe mode. Okay, so pipe mode in TensorFlow again. <clears throat> so the only difference here is that uh, you need to work with uh, uh, record files. Okay, if you're familiar with TensorFlow, you need to use TF record. If you use MXNet, yeah, you will use record IO file. You need to have your data in a format that can be split. Okay, so. Um, and, and you need to use, um, you need to use that data set object in TensorFlow that you, can, uh, that you can overload to say, okay, you will, you're not reading the data from disk, you're receiving the data from, uh, from the instances. Okay, so we have a whole notebook in there and we show you how to do this, okay? So pretty much you can fetch those samples you know, um, uh, batch by batch and train on them. Okay, so this one does require a bit of code modification because the way you're in your input function, the way uh, the data is actually read is a bit different. Okay, but you get a good example and, uh, and you can train just like this. All right. So the last feature is private link. So private link is a, a general purpose AWS service uh, or feature that lets you create uh, endpoints for AWS services inside your VPC. So you could access S3, DynamoDB, et cetera, et cetera, inside your VPC. And that means you're not going through the internet to do this, okay? So you're not going through the internet accessing the public endpoint for S3. You access it directly inside of your VPC, okay? So faster, safer, um, and, and, uh, and you, could, you can access AWS services even in a private subnet that doesn't have internet access, okay? So that's what private link is. The good news is you can now do this with SageMaker, okay? So um, if you have uh, applications running inside a private subnet and they need to get access to your uh, endpoints, they can do that with a private link and just setting up that endpoint as a, as a private link, okay? It could be a cross account, okay? So if uh, you have a data science account and you have a you know, web account, 
you could uh, you could train and deploy uh, the the endpoint in the data science account, and then using private link you could m share it and make it accessible to the web or the you know whatever application VPC. Okay, so it's a, it's an easy way to share endpoints without ever going to the internet. Okay, again faster, safer, generally better. Okay, so this is SageMaker, um, the easiest way to train, to build and train and deploy at any scale, right? With scalable algos, pipe mode if you need to, uh, batch prediction if you need to, and you can uh, save all the pain of finding the right parameters with HPO, which is, for, for a complicated thing like this, I think they, they made it really simple to use. Uh, if you want to dive deeper, uh, ml.aws is the top level <laughs> page for everything uh, machine learning. Um, this is the AI blog I was, uh, I was talking about, uh, the SageMaker page, and you'll find documentation, customer stories, etc. Um, the notebook examples on GitHub, the Python SDK, and the Spark SDK on GitHub as well. And uh, if you'd like uh, to learn a little more and dive even deeper on all those things, um, you know, you're more than welcome to follow me on Medium, uh, where I will show you some additional examples, as well as YouTube, where by now I have way too many videos from events and, and summits and whatnot. But, you know, it's, it's good to watch that again sometimes. And last but not least, if you have questions later on, I'm more than happy to connect on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, but Twitter seems to be the better way to, uh, to get fast results from me, right? That's my uh, almost real-time endpoint for Q&A, okay? Thank you very much. Um, if you have questions, of course, uh, I'll hang around. And uh, I hope you learned a few things. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.